Hey everyone, welcome to the next Maple Syrup History. Um, I see people online, they do like walking vlogs or something. So yeah, why not walk up the stairs of St. Augustine's from Monica's Coffee Shop and open the class this way and kind of walk into class already talking. Yes, guys, the video started. I started class walking up the stairs and I was like, it's gonna be cool to do that. and just kind of like freestyle walking because I'm so cool and so hip and so groovy and all that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get my uh, whatever it's called uh, music stand. I'm actually gonna play a piano song. I'm actually gonna play a piano song really loud to kind of like open up the day and then bring the music stand in here. Uh, my, I'm gonna play my little sunshine very very loud. This is like an interactive episode, crushing the entire time. <laughs> And then continuing the vlog experience over to the, the music stand into the room and then I have to go pick up my coffee and then look at all this stuff on the board. Oh, a little bit. So like I, I speak perfect fluent Polish and have my entire life because my mother is from Poland and Polish and Russian are very, very similar. Extremely similar. Like, uh, if you say in Polish, I want something to drink, it's Yastetsosh Peach. Peach is to drink, and in Russian is Yahochu Peach. It's, I mean, it's, it's almost identical. Oh. They are like even like uh, in um, Russian means like see you later, Dovizenia uh, in Polish. The problem is that Russian is written in the Cyrillic alphabet, which I can read with like a lot of difficulty, where Polish is written in our Latin alphabet. So I feel much more often comfortable like speaking and hearing it because it's so similar versus reading it and get, you know, lost things. But do you have any kind of, do you have, do you have something Russian for me to? To look yeah. at, yeah, show me, yeah. It's on the uh, one a uh, world war one. Have you tried to look at it? What's that? What's that? What's that? It's Brian, one of Brian's former students, sent in a big picture from China with Chinese characters on it, and so I didn't know what the message was. So I used Google Translate, and it works. Wow. Was it a good translation or did you have to go with that? It was a good translation. Uh -huh. I'm going to, you know, I, I don't know for sure. I used to be able to read a lot of Chinese characters. Yeah. 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 I have a friend who was um, uh, straight from me. I've never seen it. And then the last part of the week, you can the comments. And and, okay. uh, I would do flashcards with him on the Chinese characters. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, mm -hmm. so I get to learn some then, but then it's been so many years and I haven't been up at all. But it was like, so, because I'm so bad at foreign languages, mm -hmm. I need to have something in foreign languages that I was good at. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's your, is that, um, that's your rifle, 1894, right? Or, that yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a rifle my granddad right. apparently brought back from Siberia. Right. They used them in Siberia. And 13. In World War One. Oh, there's nothing on the gun. Whoops. Oh, back in the body. I don't know. I'm going to take that oh, somebody's name on uh, there and then they're <laughs> allowed to so. Nothing that gives me the caliber. Not that I've ever tried to shoot that thing. Well, there is. Are you in the war? 
something. Wait, wait, which did you erase? That's I said I erased communion. That's the way for someone to be able to decipher that for you. Well, you said that some of this is some guy's name, some of his name. Yeah, yeah. But nothing that really gives me a, a hint is the Blessed Sea Calvary. And Misery of Faith. Maybe what? I, I think I in my church, there are calendars still in here. Therefore, this in two weeks, it will be gone. I don't know, but I was talking about this guy. I know. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just correcting it for my own. That's just my own. I got it. 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 I know you told me that. It's right. Four, 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 I just okay, okay. I believe that. I got it before. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm calling you. I'm just well, it's like 50 years ago. <clears throat> this is a it's a bolt. It's like a mm -hmm. kind of a thing, but just a single key. Mm -hmm. I'll just you open the bolt, put it in the same case. This could be replaced. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's important. Yeah. I'm gonna go do more music really fast. I was doing I've been mean, doing like a walking vlog and I did my sunshine the Schmitzer code of his father? I'm gonna do Amazing Grace. Yeah, they're coming up. They're coming. I'm gonna do Amazing Grace from a real low octave all the way to the top. You guys ready? Would you like? I started my recording today on the stairs. Yeah, I've just been like in motion the entire time, I'm trying to imitate Saint Francis. It was always like wired and it didn't stop. It was just crazy and nuts. And that's what I'm going for. He was, yes. Oh, he did it. He had a podcast called Me and the Wolves. Right. It was really good. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, let's just not no nonsense. Let's get right to it. Good, good morning, everyone. Um, I have a shirt that says "Focus Idaho Fellowship of Catholic University Students Idaho." But there's a comma. You can pretend the Idaho symbol is a comma. You focus Idaho. Anyways, we're gonna get through as much as I can today. That makes grammatical sense, right? You focus Idaho versus focus comma Idaho. I'm asking Idaho to show me focus to focus with me. I'm asking all of you to focus right now on this blue-gray book. We've been working our way through, which is very much Ryan Alexander crushing that cardigan, the gray sweater. It's a similar color. He's probably more gray and this book is more blue, but anyways, uh, we're just going to go through as much as we can. And uh, Sam Crestons, I don't know if he's coming today or not, but he's been asking a couple... Sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. He's Sam, here. Sam is here? Oh, cool. He's here, not here. Yeah, here but not. Well, the reason I, the reason I mentioned him is because he's been asking about like question, you know, disputed question, that kind of stuff. We're gonna do that next class, right? We said that the, the sixth Aquinas set we're gonna talk about should football be banned, whatever, you know. Much, those that wish to weigh in on that, maybe not everybody has how much time are you allowed for this? I'll probably do the whole class next time. Okay. Close to it. We'll see. I mean, like what I want to do too is remind me, I want to do a full review next class too, because Next week, we're off. Everyone understands that, right? Next week is spring break. And Father has always asked me, and I agree with him wholeheartedly, that when spring break is happening, we won't have class. Because again, like I say this a million times too, if God willing, ever these courses are credited or whatever, et cetera, I, I still want all of you in that class. If we were on campus, university and it's for credit, I want all of you there. And people always are welcome to come audit my classes, be there, period. But like being a student center, like the students are the driving force of like the schedule determination, if that makes sense. So next week we're totally off because of that. Even though so I'm going to be here, I'm going to be on the blues. Maybe you are as well. We could meet, but we're not going to meet next week. So next class, however time much all lot will be depending upon you know how much if we finish this today or not. And maybe even like we won't finish it completely and we'll spend a little bit of class maybe like to half and half maybe that answers your question best that will a lot like half the time to do these disputed questions i'll probably bring in three or four topics 
And I'm going to want to do like not just the football one, but kind of find a style. Here's the postulation. Here are three objections. I answer that. You know, we'll see how we do that. Like I'm not going to I'm not going to be a point. It's like we all will be. We'll take sides and we'll debate, and then we'll respond to objections and go through just like burning burning issues. I state that Russia should sue for peace immediately, or Ukraine should stop fighting and even territorial secessions to Russia, or not. Like that, we're going to cover the recent Ukrainian war, football, a lot of burning issues, perhaps. Um, what I want to do next class, though, is because we're breaking for spring break, I want to go back and review our early, our first three classes. We've done a very, very good job. It's been very fun. If you notice, we'll be at maple syrup number 17, excuse me, or at maple syrup 51 or 52, logic number 17 by the end of next week or this week. And 35% is Aquinas. Six divided into 17 is 35.3%. So more than one third of the class. How do I know that? How do I know that? Because of batting averages. If you have six hits and 17 at bats, really. Perfect. Baseball is awesome for um, numbers. Yeah. Like eight, eight. Baseball. Well, that's boring. It's boring. There's a reason mathematicians are obsessed with baseball. Robert Adair wrote a book called The Physics of Baseball. Like scientists, mathematicians, all, all good people like baseball. And if you don't like baseball, it works both ways. You're probably not good or smart. Um, baseball comes from. The Chosen. What is The Chosen? Uh, the movie about Christ? The, 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 uh, see, the, the book. The, um, the, 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 oh, I've never seen this. I have never seen this movie. Really? It's a baseball movie? Oh, good. Yeah, no, no. Oh, good. No, that's awesome. Everybody should read it. Yeah. Is it about baseball? There's in it, but it's not about baseball. Okay. okay, it's called The Chosen, you said? Yes. Awesome, thanks. No, I'm always up for I've never heard that book. It's, it's um, uh, an Orthodox Jewish boy and a Hasidic Jewish boy who meet through baseball. Oh, good. Ah. Cool. That sounds awesome. Yeah. New York. I'm already hooked. New York, yes. Um, mm -hmm. What I want to do next... Uh, you know, six out of 17 classes, this class number five, six on Wednesday, have been quite as heavy. We're doing a great job. With spring break being a natural demarcation between A and B, first and second half of semesters, we were going to go back and review all the fallacies. I really wanted this. So that might cut into some work, but that's fine. I want to go and have the plumber's logic sheet up again and go over all the fallacies we covered. It'll be sweet. It'll be like, we started with that, then we've just been doing textual analysis and reading the whole time, return back to the sources. Mm -hmm. And then that's what's what uh, Vatican II wanted to do. Okay, so Simone, right? Back to the sources and aggiornamento. Aggiornamento, we do in Italian. Aggiornamento, certo, questo è vero, è bello, bellissimo. Um, so we're going to do that, the kind of like back to the sources of this class. Um, the class will be, because your smile is so nice. Thank you for your smile. We'll do it all in Italian, the class, we'll with subtitles. Italian. I'll keep doing Italian. <laughs> um, I know that all the good words in Italian, like forget about it, you know, <laughs> like don't make me get, don't make me use this hand. Like I, I know, I know all Italian stuff. All right. So let's just do Aquinas. Let's get back to, speaking of Italian guys, speaking of, of big Italian news. So do you all know the eternal law? I answer that we can know things in two ways, in one way in themselves, in a second way in their effects, which are like the things. For example, those who are not looking at the sun know it in the effects of its rays. Therefore, we can say no one except the blessed who see God by his essence can know the eternal law as it is in itself. But every rational creature knows it in some of its radiating effects, whether greater or lesser effect. So Aquinas basically said a couple of things very beautifully put as his work is just absolute pure honeycomb gold. It's all truly so beautiful, so logical. So perfectly beautifully logical. To be in heaven, right, is to, is to behold the beatific vision, to see God face to face, the ultimate reward, right? Nothing but you, Lord, as Aquinas himself says. So perfect truth, perfect actually logic and rationality, unclouded by our fallen world, is only to be found in heaven. So only the blessed who behold the beatific vision see things as they really are in every possible way, he says. But the second part is like, no, there's no excuses. I would, that's what I think from it. I told you that thing about Archbishop Fulton Sheen when the one young woman was arrested for shoplifting or embezzlement or something in like a New York hotel in the 50s. 
He talks about this one of his homilies and she claimed, I didn't know it was wrong to steal. No, right? Yeah. It, like everyone knows that. Everyone has that Aboriginal vicar of Christ as St. John Henry Newman said, that your conscience, everyone has that. And thank God for good parents, good um, educators, great priests, whatever it may be, people that form us. Thank God for that. Even if you're in a very bad circumstance and the worst circumstance is, mm -hmm. everyone, even by radiating effects, can know the natural law, can know the eternal law, can know what is right and wrong. He's saying, right? All right. Is every law derived from the eternal law? Aquinas asks. Well, and I promise I'll open up to questions really soon. Uh, since the eternal law is the plan of government and the supreme ruler, all plans of government in subordinate rulers need to be derived from the eternal law. But such plans of subordinate government consist of all the other laws besides the eternal law. And so all laws are derived from the eternal law insofar as they partake of right reason. And so Augustine says in his work on free choice that, quote, nothing is just or lawful in earthly laws that human beings have not derived for, for themselves from the eternal law. That makes sense, plumber logic. What you so that you're saying, Doctor Groucho, I can have a completely secular legal system that doesn't question to any value whatsoever. Is that exactly. what Aquinas is saying? Exactly. Oh my goodness. How, what a what a re what a revolutionary thing. Yeah. No, it's like yeah, they can have an objective legal system. Right. But exactly, like you know, oh, or even the idea of like bifurcating things, or you know, putting them in a corner or something. Like, well, that's just your religious idea. I don't impose that on me. It's like. Well, okay. I mean, but if, if if it's just up to your kind of your own interpretation, your own relativistic voluntarism, what, what you know, detached from right reason, as he says, literally quoting, literally partake of right reason, rationality, ultimate plumber's logic, common sense, founded in the source of all goodness and truth, God Himself. Then, then maybe that's a great reason for all the chaos in our society. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, we're going to talk, it's going to be exciting after spring break to get into a lot of the chaos beginning with people like um, William of Ockham with nominalism and Descartes, Cogito Ergo Sum, and all the stuff that falls after that. Mm -hmm. And we're going to read a very chaotic book, uh, well, uh, selections from, I'll bring them in, Dave Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest about like, what does the world look like in a complete post-relativistic chaos dedicated simply to hedonistic self-styled pleasure? His book would be even so much more apropos today with like YouTube channels and things that are just for me. I don't even I don't even watch the pleasurable stuff all of us do, like Brady Bunch, you know, in the 70s on Nick at Night or something, right? Where all of us watch, all of us watch Walter Cronkite. No, mm -hmm. now it's so specialized in my own invented universe of pleasure. I just have my own channels and things. And anyways, does the natural law include several precepts or only one? The order of our natural inclinations ordains the precepts of the natural law. First, for example, human beings have an inclination for good by the nature they share with all substances. Namely, as every substance by nature seeks to preserve itself, and regarding this inclination means that preserve our human life, rent the contrary belong to the natural law. Second, human beings have more particular inclinations by the nature they share with other animals. So the digest says that things, quote, at that nature has taught all animals such as the sexual union of male and female and the upbringing of children and the like belong to the natural law. Third, human beings have inclinations for good by their rational nature, which is proper to them. For example, human beings by nature have inclinations to know truths about God and to live in society with other human beings. And so things that relate, relate to such inclinations belong to the natural law. And he st states, for example, that human beings shun ignorance. They do not offend those whom they ought to live sociably. St. Paul talks about this. In one of his uh, in one of his letters in the New Testament, that they offend that they not offend those whom they ought to live socially. He famously says, "Aim for a tranquil life. Aim for tranquility. Be at peace with everyone as far as that's possible." And other such things regarding those inclinations. Okay, open question. Aquinas asks, "Do all virtuous acts belong to natural law?" What do you think? Yes or no? No, because then how would supernatural virtues play? That's why that's why that might be an objection. You might disagree with that, but supernatural virtues do not belong to the natural law, the theological virtues, so therefore not all virtues belong to the natural law. And what is natural law? What do you mean by that? So again, great question, right? He says with natural law and all law, he's like that's my human law in general is the dictative reason directing human nature. And Dave made an addendum to that, which I thought was a good addition, a good audible kind of. He's like, what if we say human law isn't dictated reason directed to human nature, but human behavior? 
So, right, and often then we get the question of the common good. And natural law, that which maybe our earlier point about the sun's radiating rays, that which all people, irrespective of their blessedness, irrespective of the grace to see the full truth, irrespective of their faith, even the most ignorant, atheistic, detached person can live by the natural law, the conscience, in other words. Right? Maybe natural law equals this class, logic, plumbers, heady. Natural law is don't hurt other people because it's obvious, because you don't want to be hurt. Be one to others. That golden rule is a great stick. The, the golden rule comes from Matthew 7, 12, right? Um, it's in the Sermon of the Mount. It's in the Bible. But it's that that's a great example of the natural law, perhaps. Do not do to others what you have them do to you. Or do what others if you have them do to you. Everyone can understand that. Yeah, I'd like to steal this guy's thing. But, you know, I got to admit, I'm going to be fair. I got to admit, I probably wouldn't want him to steal my thing. So I probably shouldn't do that. I can't think beyond that. But just that's probably not cool, that kind of thing. And that's natural law, right? So he lists three objections, then he says, I have said that everything to which human beings are inclined by their nature belongs to natural law. But everything is by its nature inclined to the activity that its form renders fitting. For example, fire is inclined to heat things. This is 100% the philosopher Aristotelian stuff, right? Remember, like, you know, um, eudaimonia, ultimate happiness comes from arete, like excellence and virtue. That's often like a pencil is most arete onto eudaimonia by fact of it writing well, being sharp you know, not fraying, like, if it does what it's supposed to do to the, quote, best version of itself is proper. Everything by its nature inclined to the activity, its form and fitting. for example, fire is inclined to heat things, and so since the rational soul is the specific form of human beings, everyone has an inclination from one's nature to act in accord with reason. That's just Teddy, 100% plumber's logic, this class. Everyone has an inclination from one's nature to act in accord with reason. And this is to act virtuously. And so in this regard, all virtuous acts belong to the natural law since one's own reason by nature dictates that one act virtuously. And to your, I think your objection is very good. He'd probably say that's something super abundant. Literally super in Latin means above, right? Above. Super is over. So over nature. So he's saying here, virtue itself, kind of common virtue, even the pagan virtue, people like that we study, like, Plato and Aristotle and Cicero belongs to not supernature, but nature. And therefore, supernature is another whole kind of metaphysical category, perhaps. Okay. Uh, this book is seriously so good. Once more, I'll promote it. It was not expensive at all. It was like five bucks, I think. Aquinas, On Law, Morality, and Politics, Second Edition, translated by Richard J. Either Regan or Reagan. I have no idea how his name is pronounced. It's not spelled like the president. Uh, Ronald Reagan was R E A G A N. This is just R E G A N. Regan. Why well, she pronounces like Regan or something? <laughs> it's been a pretentious way. Well, it's actually Egan. The part of Scotland that I come from, ours are silent. My name is Itchard Egan. Ours is silent in both names. Very, very good book. I thought the North pronounced their R's more and more. In Scotland? In, in in North US or North Scotland? In Scotland, they kill the ours. If you guys ask me yeah, tonight. So if, you, if, you go, if you go to the UK, the further north you go, the um, more the ours are pronounced. And further west. Oh, north. cool. I, see, and I'm then people um, tease people about pronouncing their ours. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that, that's good to know because I know but, uh, about as much about Scotland, the UK, as I know about like some hole in Jupiter. And that's how much I care to know. The answer is nothing. <laughs> I know as much about Scotland as the dark side of the moon. Moving on. No, that's good. That's, that's, that's good. Aeolode. And then, it's even, and then yeah, that, that's a good joke because Aeolode, Aeolode is how the guys end up getting drunk. The guy's like, the guy's like, I work for the railroad. We kept saying ale, but they brought him a load of ale and it's got plastered. Guys, did I tell you my board? Did anyone know what, what is board and batten? What, what? what is board and batten? It's like planks, right? Interspersed with Good. Trips. Okay, did I, did I thank you exactly? Did I tell you my board and batten joke? Uh, I've got mixed reviews on this. So I'll see what you guys think. What did the sorority girl say to her friend, Mark Batten, during chemistry class? What did the sorority girl say to her friend, Mark Batten, during chemistry class? 
I'm batting. bored batting. I like it. I think it's good. I, I think it's good, but <laughs> it's a groaner. <laughs> I'm bored of that and you entertain me. No, the, the petulant. I like, like the petulance of the sorority girl character that I've been doing. Well, I think it's impressive that you have a G rated sorority girl joke. There you go. Cool. You exactly. Go. It, oh, Betsy, oh, thanks. Oh. I appreciate that. Thank you. No, the, yeah, exactly. No, the, the best, like PG rated one was like, what do you call, what do you call an attractive woman on blank campus? What do you call an attractive woman on super nice? Yeah, exactly. A visitor. That's the, <laughs> that's a really good one. Should human laws be framed in particular rather than general terms? I answer that everything for an end needs to be proportioned to the end, but the end of law is common good. The end of the law, and by end he means, this is amazing. Please write this down. I can blaze this in your head. What does Christ say in chapter Matthew chapter five? I think it's five seventeen. You know about um, not a, not a single you know part of the law will pass until the end of time. Christ is the fulfillment of the law. The end of something doesn't mean it's over; it's canceled. It means you can't do it better. It's it's, it's fulfilled. The end can mean fulfillment, not just cessation. A great example I often use with my design students is um, the Great Pyramid is built in the fourth dynasty of the old kingdom like 2400 bc 4400 years ago and the great pyramid was a an upward evolution from things like the bent pyramid the red pyramid and they started with these things called mastabas like sacred mounds ziggurat like structures the great pyramid is the end of pyramids you can say because it's the fulfillment you can't go grander so the next guy the next pharaoh i think kafre i think is his name k-h-a-f-r-e he does the, the sphinx because he's like, I can't do more. Thomas Aquinas, some people said he's, he's, he's the end of Catholic philosophy. Like he is the height. We should always be going back. That's why uh, Pope Leo the Thirteenth, I believe, in 1879, writes attorney, uh, attorney Patris about so making Aquinas like bringing him back to the forefront. This is the guy. He, 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 he kind of influences in some ways that encyclical does this neo Thomistic revolution, and then going back to Thomas, a rediscovering of Thomas. Um, so here he's, he's using that great pyramid style, Christ, I am the film of the law. It's passing, it's, it's not passing away, or it's not over because it's X, it's over because it's completed. By the end of the law is the common good. When you reach the common good, it's not a speed unlawful, it's that's the whole point of the law. By end, he means telos, the goal. So I'm gonna actually use, I'm gonna go Dave Schmidt. Dave Schmidt edited Aquinas. It's good enough for him. I can do that too, I guess. Um, so instead of by the end of the law, the goal of the law is the common good, since, quote, law should be framed for the common benefit of citizens, not for any private benefit. So human laws need to be proportioned to the common good. Human laws need to be proportioned or proportionate, tuned to common good. But the common good consists of many things, and so laws need to regard many things, both persons, matters, and times. For the political community consists of many persons. And it's good is procured by many actions. Maybe this kind of like conglomeration, this aggregate of these different good actions bound up into what we call, in the end, the goal of the common good. Nor is it instituted to endure only for a short time, but to last for all time through successive generations of citizens, as Augustine said, in the city of God. So in what you just read, is in a perfect world, perhaps, is human law and natural law synonymous? No, because I think I would use, I would say, and I'll let Ryan answer for himself, but I'll just say quickly, like, I'm going to quote Ryan, so we're going to get double Ryan, me quoting him and he's speaking for himself. He said earlier just about the kind of state of law now, like this associated from, well, it's like you know, in a perfect world. Yeah, exactly, so maybe, okay, in a perfect world, certainly, yeah, so I'm told by that, I totally messed up. I ignored 100% the most important part of your statement, which is in a perfect world. In the world, human law is very much not attuned, maybe in a perfect world would be, what do you, how do you answer? I answer that, well, Ryan says. I think, I think pre-fall would be more or less synonymous. It's really just a kind of very active speculative question about whether there'd be things like parking regulations in a pre-fall world, which don't really admit of right or wrong, they're just bordering society. But if but post but post-fall is certainly not the case that first off, some laws need to be greater restrictions than what the natural law would provide. And then second, there are some laws like you drive on the right side of the road, which are not really demanded by the natural law per se. But our but still our right right reason orders because otherwise people would be 
running into each other. Perhaps, maybe everyone would just like hustle and not do that. Mm -hmm. Good point. That's, that's a good point. So that's all I say to that. Cool. So in that perfect world, maybe this is graphic, but in that perfect world, um, human law wouldn't even be necessary. Correct. I'd say that I mean I'd say that even in the Christian context, if we're if we're fully infused with charity, then there's no need for law mm -hmm. of any kind because we are because we, if we're, if we're full, acting in full accord with charity, then there's no need for there's no need for regulations on our behavior. And if we do anything wrong by accident, then charity would compel us to fix that ourselves. So there's no need for some legal mechanism to force us to fix. That's it. cool. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's why St. Paul gets it always like those, you know, in grace in Christ are free from the law, right? They have a self-regulating, yeah, exactly. Even desire to overcome my own foibles and faults um, willfully. I want to render, do justice. Remember what justice is, as he defines it in Cicero. Justice is giving everyone their due. That's why we pray for God's mercy. We don't, please, Lord, do not consider what I truly deserve. Rather, you know, show mercy upon me. We can be perfectly just as well in the non-fallen world. Speaking of fallen world, does it belong to human laws to prohibit all vices? What does Aquinas say? Right, we talked about that in the first class, right? Human laws establish the collectivity of human beings, most of whom have imperfect virtue, even the good ones. And so human law does not prohibit every kind of vice from which the virtuous abstain. Rather, human law prohibits only the most serious kind of vice from which most persons can abstain and especially those vices that inflict harm on others, without the prohibition of which human society cannot be preserved. For example, human laws prohibit murders, thefts, and the like. If you have this kind of society that allows those things, you have those disgusting horror movies like The Purge, which I have never seen and would never see, but where it's like, everything is legal. That's, yeah, exactly. Or what do you think? That's just literally like, you actually get a Nietzschean Uberman paradise. It literally becomes might makes right. Whoever can do whatever they want, strong to survive, which is absolutely horrifying. So, so, yeah, very, again, I, I'm at pains to keep repeating this, but I'm going to keep saying it. Like, look how beautifully logical. Like, we can do the whole class on Thomas Aquinas. This is just his brief thoughts on law morality. I assume it's like thousands of pages long. You don't even tap into that. We could do that. Go, no, go ahead. Go, go. Oh, well, I was going to, again, Ryan here is really great. Um, I was going to say um, the challenge, I think, for me is with that conversation is Someone has to all sort of prioritize and categorize the same whole place. Mm -hmm. So yeah, certainly murder, not good. I mostly agree with that. However, oh, I eat too much chocolate. Back to that. Yeah, that's a vice, but am I really hurting anything? Well, what if that chocolate isn't chocolate? Now it's kind of you know. So we so it gets really complicated really quickly in terms of which vices matter in terms of a society. As compared to perhaps your own soul. So, this is a great, if you ask, no, go ahead. So, I think what Thomas would say is St. Thomas would say is that all vices are legitimate for the civil authority to regulate. Like, the, the civil authority can't do like an evil thing by regulating vice, but it can cause other evils to happen. So, that is the balancing act, it's a prudential act of the statesman in crafting the law. You don't that, yeah, it's like a prudent statement has to sit there and say, is it worth regulating gluttony? If, you know, if we do regulate gluttony, how should we do it? Well, maybe we should stop Hershey's from putting cocaine in all of this chocolate. That probably seems like a good thing to do, you know, or things like that. Um, but we're probably not going to go to people's <laughs> houses and stop people from eating Hershey's, but we should probably stop the manufacturer from doing this thing. And that's when, the, that's the act of the law. Very well yeah, said. 32 pounds drinks and stuff like that. Which I think has been a little long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, there's stuff like that that you know we, we may think it's stupid, but the reason we think it's stupid is because we think it's a bad idea, not because we think people should always and everywhere drink right. 32 ounce drinks. Right. We might think, well, that affects me because I only get a 32 ounce drink when I'm on a road trip, but I'm not a glutton when I do that. You know, I only do that twice a year. Right, right, right. But then you know, but then the, the lawgiver thinks, well, this is not something that really should be happening. At all, and in fact, we should have smaller drinks or, or or things like that, and that's and that's the debate, and that's what you have to do, to like do this particular analysis. And so the libertarian thing just is throw it all to the side and say we don't care about all that. But if you'll notice, one of the things we're saying is that libertarianism kind of 
demands charity, demands perfect charity. If we have, if we all have perfect charity, I think we could live in a libertarian society and it would be problem. Yeah, you could have anarchy if it wasn't. Uh, attuned to burning stuff and writing and whatever, like if you have actual um, self regulating, it would still be unfortunate if our society was uh, so libertarian that we had no conventions for um, right of way or anything like that. I think those would fall on the like like Okay, with perfect yeah. charity, yeah. yes, with perfect charity. even without perfect charity. I think if you just had people driving on the road and there was no law, people would. Have a habit of doing yeah, it. Yeah, sure. They know it's stupid. Even, yeah, even just for my own comfort. I don't want to get fender benders all the time or just be stuck in the bottom. Some time in India where it seems mm -hmm. there's no rules for driving, <laughs> but there we, just, we observe no accident. Isn't that crazy? Uh, I, I like driving, walking, yeah. crying on. Yeah, it's like walking in the crowd. They would stop like, but they pay any attention to them. We we go with each other. A lot more fatal accidents there statistically too. I heard he had the vast majority of Russians don't wear a seatbelt. FYI. Um, <laughs> yeah, some the, the Russian one of the some Russian some Russian uh, some Russian thinker recently said that Russians Russian fatalism is yeah. deeply. Embedded almost as like those Buddhist monks. It's kind of fatalistic. Well, just uh, it's going to be what it is, kind of thing. Um, all right. Should human laws always be revised for something better? I answered that. As I have said, human laws are revised insofar as their revision serves the common good, common good. But the very revision of laws considered as such involves some detriment to the common will, the whole society, right? For custom avails very much the observance of law, since we regard things done contrary to common custom, even if those things be themselves slight, as rather serious. And so the binding force of law is diminished when laws are revised, since custom is removed. Mm -hmm. If you keep all the customs that are not illicit or bad, or if it's not broke, don't fix it, you say, right? Well, it's more like if you've got something that's good, you want to keep people in the habit of doing the good thing rather than changing the standards so that people lose the habit because then they yeah, exactly. get weak. And yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of lessons from that. No, that's like people habitually knee jerk reaction do good things. And if you change it, even if something's a little bit better, maybe you go back to ground zero because they forget mm -hmm. the habit or yeah. it's more detriment that way. But the, 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 in American law, that's the idea of stare decisis with court cases that you tend to try not to over contradict higher, mm -hmm. you can't contradict higher authority, but you don't go back on your own decisions if better are at all possible because it is, it does. It unsettles things. It's like got it. Yeah. It's it's like going to quicksand and starting to beat on it with a with a with a branch, which will unstable unstabilize it. Right. Or the yeah, you say that basically like well, then the last fifty years under the aegis of this decision is now illicit or yeah. it was wrong yeah. decided. So I guess everything you guys did in response to that was wrong because it's wrong. Or I guess you're saying like the unsettling nature of well, taking the foundation out from it. Here's an example of my own personal opinion: the Miranda rights decision. Completely unconstitutional. Like it doesn't, the constitution doesn't require Miranda rights. Miranda rights means that they must read you, you have the right to remain silent. Yeah, that's it. just the Supreme Court was legislating. It's, there's no rights to that thing. Where the heck is that in the constitution? The Supreme Court saw what it thought was a problem and then said, we're going to fix it and we're going to require this to happen on every single level. Well, that was a bad decision. I don't think that was required. I don't know if it necessarily has had any good or bad consequences, but I would never change it. And by the reason it's so baked into things, like why even it, it's not worth it. Right, cops in their in training, right? Or just that's one of the first mm -hmm. things they learn. Like when you're in the process of an arrest or whatever. Not only that, it's in every single TV show TV since, show, the, yeah. since the decision came out. It's just yeah. so ubiquitous that there'd be no good reason to eliminate it. It would just get rid of one of one stable thing in our legal system. Why did I think it been recently eliminated in the past few years? Ah, there was a decision that was meant where you couldn't recover damages if they were violated. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is complicated. There's a statute where you can sue for violation of rights, and Supreme Court held you couldn't sue for a violation of Miranda rights purely. You needed something more. So, so is that in some ways a partial overturning or making it less important? It's not really an overturning because of Miranda rights. If you confess without to a crime without having been read Miranda rights, that confession stays out of trial. You can't bring okay. it. In. So it, it still stays out of trial. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which 
that that whole rule lets and that that itself is its own debate. That's called the exclusionary rule. The idea that when the constable is blundered, the criminal goes free. You know, it's mm. if if the police screw up, then you don't get to bring in good evidence against a criminal trial because it was obtained unconstitutionally. Mm. Aquinas earlier framed the relationship between Christians and Jews and the old and new law. He talked about the old law pertaining to, you know, uh, earthly things, right? And that he's searching for the land of milk and honey. And it's kind of often like prohibitionary things, thou shalt not. Whereas the good law, the new law, uh, fulfilled in the good shepherd himself, the end, the kind of the telos, Christ, towards love and the supernatural. But here he asks, can human beings be dispensed from the commandments, the Decalogue? And he says, no, right? The, these, that, you know, the, the dietary customs are fulfilled, right? And Christ is the fulfillment of the entire old law. But these eternal moral commandments, they do not change. They remain binding, right? And he says, um, here's the, the, the chapter of, no. The commandments, the Decalogue, include the very aim of the lawmaker, namely God. For the commandments, the first tablet, which direct human beings in relation to God, include the very order to human beings' common and ultimate good, that is, God. And the commandments, the second tablet, include the very order of justice to be observed in human society. Remember, justice, rendering everyone their due. The very order of justice to be observed in human society, namely that nothing improper be done to anyone, and that one should render to others what is their due. For we should so understand the commandments of the Decalogue, which the commandments of the Decalogue cannot be dispensed from. At all. Um, so again, that really annoying buffer sticker, because all buffer stickers are, but it's like, yeah, you know, Ten Commandments, 3,500 years old, still relevant. Yeah, I mean, actually morally binding, right? Yeah, the moral precepts of the old law, no, but if, yes, sir. I was going to say, we were, we were just talking about this, and I'm trying to look up that I forgot one. Um, right, okay, there's, I think our catechism talks about three different types of law, mm -hmm. and one of them is uh, hopeful, and so that goes into the, um, you know, proper attire and so on, very circumstantial and what have you. And then there's, um, uh, I can't remember quite where the like Leviticus and all the dietary laws fall, uh, what that is playing like. Uh, but the, the one you're talking about is moral law, that category, which lives forever, and it goes across cultures. and. No matter where you are from, like the chill is exactly. And look at look at even like the difference between doctrine and discipline in the Catholic Church. Like priests mm -hmm. have been married, they can be married again. Church celibacy is a discipline that can be you know tweaked with. And I say I have the deepest respect, but what a vulgar term is if it's just like oh whatever. But like you know, if the church can change that. You, the church cannot change the amount of conception of Blessed Virgin Mary or the real presence of the Eucharist. These are doctrinal matters that will last to the end of time. So same thing, yeah, the moral precepts of the old law remain forever. It does not remain forever. Like you shall not have a certain goat with X amount of hair or something. Like, it's like that. That's, yeah. yeah. Even like recently, um, I, for FYI, have zero tattoos. And most likely will never get a tattoo. Probably not. I considered, I had ideas of certain tattoos I get. I just keep coming back to like, I just don't want to do that. Like, like on, on every single level. Did you like, say you tattooed a zero? Okay. Tattooed zero on me? To is that what you said just now? My, my self esteem. Yeah. <laughs> this is how I feel about myself. I am a zero. So no, I, I have zero. I have zero desire to have a tattoo. Oh. <laughs> the very funny word. Point, yeah, zero tattoo. point to you. I have zero tattoos. The word itself is it just a tattoo? Right. Yeah. I have zeros all over my body. All over my body. But no, but what I'm getting at, but this is like, it, it, there's a point, I think in, there's a thing in Leviticus, it says, you know, don't mark your body and stuff. Father Mike Schmitz, I don't know if you saw this recently, got a tattoo. You know I mean? You're horrified by it? Yep. Um, so I have my, my, my mother-in-law, God bless her, amazing woman, truly. Like I, I have the two best parents, you know, my, my, my normal parents, and who are my heroes, my mom and dad, both. They're both like almost like an older brother and sister too. Like I have a great relationship with my parents, thank God. I love my in-laws if they're my own parents. It's really nice too. Thank God for that. None of this like classic old mother-in-law. I love my mother-in-law. She's super anti-tattoo. She seems they're like straight evil. Like there's oh, she's 100 percent to the wall. And then I have family members that have lots of tattoos. They're awesome and whatever. I honestly don't, I don't care. I don't have I don't have either. I definitely don't think you should get like evil stuff tattooed on your body, obviously. 
But if someone gets like a cross in their body, is that thing that like, I just don't, I don't care. I'm not going to get a tattoo. Father Mike Schmitz recently did. He did a video on it. He had done a video four years ago. And you can look this up. Like it's a recent video where he's like, should you get a tattoo? And he goes into exactly what you said. That basically, Catholics are not forbidden from getting tattoos, he says. And that's part of that old law that can change. That you can have a tattoo. It depends what tattoo. But he, a good idea. But exactly. He kind of came down that it wasn't. But he, the, the reason, if you saw the new video, he got a, some kind of cross in Jerusalem mm -hmm. from this very famous tattoo artist. Mm -hmm. Great, like cool, but 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 it's just I mean, that, there's no punch right here, like whatever, whatever floats your boat. I'm simply saying tattoos are a great example of this thing that's forbidden in the old Jewish law, like do not cut your mark your body, which now it's like that's apparently where, where he, where is on his arm right here. Like here. Yes. I have a girl in my college who has one. It's like right here on, mm -hmm. on the wrist. Yeah. And it's like a well, it's it's a lot of like, young women have tattoos now, yeah. It's no, she got it from the same from, from the same guy. Okay. I'm pretty sure she got it in Jerusalem while she went to the Holy Land because there it's it's pretty old. Like it goes back to the time of the Crusades, this tradition at least of of tattooing pilgrims to the Holy Land. That specific and, one. Yeah. yeah. Would you like, would you get it? Um probably not, but it was is because I disagree with that tradition. Mm -hmm. I just don't think I'd do it. Right. Uh I think that. You'll notice, like all the bad, all the bad reasons you could come up with for getting a tattoo, none of them apply to that, to that circumstance. I think I'm doing it just to fit in with the crowd. Well, guess what? When you got that tattoo, you're going to identify yourself not as like some gang punk, but like some yeah. It's like wearing it's like, it's like wearing ashes all year. It's like I'm a Christian. Like yeah, it, it, and it's a reminder to yourself. It's a reminder to others. It's a reminder of where you've been, what you've done. All of these things is like to keep keep it on your mind and on present on your body and like all these things which are probably better than like mom tattooed on your on your on your bicep or whatever kind of wild things that people come with like cartoon characters on your ankle or <laughs> exactly you know like it's yeah. categorically just different sure i agree so, i and actually i'm not gonna lie like i'm not trying to just be agreeable to you i like second you 100 i have no problem with it and I just probably wouldn't do it. I just probably I don't want to get needle. Like I just I don't like I don't, I don't yeah. Like that kind of very simple, like I don't want, <laughs> yeah. Like, hey, let me sit here. This is yeah, that's the attraction. <laughs> that is the attraction. Sure. That, you know, I I, I gotta be great. Of course. Yeah. I, I have a friend, I'm not gonna mention who it is, it's being recorded, but I have a friend who just got a line tattoo on his hand, just to prove he get a tattoo. <laughs> Okay, I mean, like, I know John, like, he's wanting to just get it done. And then he got a bunch of other ones and stuff. And what's, what I find very interesting recently is, like, everyone knows this story. It's the classic story, right? Tattoos used to be gang members in prison. Like, and then now everyone, everyone knows that. Like, it used to be, like, a sign that you had done time, and then it's become very popular. And now it's, like, the most, you know, bad, bleep, you know, it's Lent. I might even use the donkey word. But bad donkey. <laughs> These are more state members. Yeah, exactly. But the, 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 the most state thing you could do now is like not have a tattoo. That means you're hard. Like you don't have one because everyone has one. What I just find interesting, and Betsy, don't lose your train of thought. What I find very interesting is like this is no judgment. How many young women have tattoos? I've seen really like, you know, in all purity, like beautiful young girls, um, you know, college girls who you think are just like, and like maybe they are like paragons of virtue amazing. I would never judge a person. But it's like a beautiful college girl, 22 year old girl, and she's like three tattoos. It's just like, I always been, wow, even my generation, like my millennial, 10 years ago in college, 15 years ago, there's not a lot of girls that I do that I had tattoos. Now it's very, very popular, Gen Z. And, okay. Parker's back. Who's Parker? Parker's back. That's why are you on Parker's, no. Oh. Is, it, is it about, is it about, a yeah. is it about, a, Parker gets a tattoo on his back? Parker, yes. He finally gets a tattoo on his back. To please his Christian wife who repudiates him. For getting a tattoo? For getting a tattoo. He was a tattoo. Guy. And again, the symbolism of right. Flannery O'Connor. Yeah, it's <laughs> I have a tattoo of Flannery O'Connor, actually. I, I'm obliged yeah. under a certain law, and someone mentioned her name, so I have, have Flannery O'Connor's tattoo, a face tattooed on my chest. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, um, his wife is the most sour um most protestant most anti um kind of puritanical yeah, warm yeah, shows, it, sure. it, 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 him getting a um, tattoo of christ would just be the most terrible thing sure sure 
<laughs> but then, I mean, the, the, here's a spoiler. At the very end, for me anyway, at the very end, he comes home finally to impress his wife. Look, you know, I you know, I do love you or whatever. And here's my tattoo. And she she goes ballistic and, and beats him. And so here's the image. Right. He's actually, yeah, he, he's being he's scared. Flawed. Yeah. Yeah, it's really rich. But Eric Connor is really, yeah, she's yeah. great with that. She's yeah. really good with that. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Guys, before we continue, I'm giving a hippo lecture in two weeks, um, which is the 22nd. Because remember, next week, this Wednesday, we have nothing. The campus ministry had spirit in life last week, obviously. Um, we have nothing next week. And then hippo, I am so excited. I really think it's gonna be the best one I've ever given. I know I say this every single time, but it really, it's called St. Seraphim of Moscow. So there, there's a famous Russian monk, Seraphim Savarov, amazing guy. Apparently John Paul II called him a, a he was a saint. He's not canonized with the church, he's canonized with the Russian Orthodox Church. But he's just a guy, St. Seraphim of Serov, think um, St. Anthony of Egypt, hermit, lived in the woods, you know, very holy man, apparently. Um, I recently got his book, his life teachings, very cool stuff. He's just like, he's a modern day Saint Anthony. I, I love desert monastics for whatever reason. He's a desert monastic, but in forest. He would give food to bears, kind of cool stuff like that. Saint Sarah from Moscow is a modern story I'm going to write about a homeless man in Moscow, Idaho now, as a huge plague of dust sweeps America. I just, I can't wait. I'm going to go, I think this time, like, I'm always so grateful for the people that come to our hippo. Like, we have, 33 people, 52, you know, once had 70, I think, but usually like 40. I'm just always like honored because people have a million other things to do. Get all of Moscow to come out for this talk. It's going to be my most sincere, best talk I've ever given. My first, I don't know if you guys saw the note I sent out. But thank God the first hit was game this year, January, February are coming out. One is already published. One is coming out soon. And that's always great because like that just highlights what we do here and all that. Those talks were not for everyone. That's just the first talk. I would never give a profanity waste talk in Lent, but the person was kind of, you know, whatever. This talk, if you, I always say don't bring kids. You can actually bring kids to you. It's going to be a very kind of sincere um, talk, but very, I just, I can't wait. I cannot wait to give this talk. It's called St. Seraphim of Moscow. It's a play inspired by that guy, but kind of modern circumstances. Husband and wife team. The guy's name is Dave. The wife's name is Lucy. I was going to go Dave and Trish, but I'm like, I'll just do Lucy. Um, that way, that way I have... That way I have I have plausible deniability. I'm actually gonna read you. Listen, I'm, I'm gonna read you uh really quickly, just a thing from it really fast, just to show you what I mean. So Lucy is the Lucy's the mayor of Moscow in the story, and Dave is her is her husband, who's like an oligarch uh owner of like a bunch of buildings and stuff. And he okay, anyways, so about how awesome Moscow is. Um, much of the credit must certainly be attributed to the local power couple team, Mr. and Mrs. Craigmore. Lucy Craigmore, mayor, recently reelected by an outstanding 77% of the vote. Dave Craigmore, her husband, local land oligarch, if you will, who made no small fortune in the California real estate game and snazzy stuffed the rafters rich Carmel by the sea. And that brought and then brought that capital with him here. He certainly made money, bona fide cash, earning him a one-time mini feature in Forbes. But what people like the most about Dave is that he used to be a regular at Clint Eastwood's Thursday night poker games. I don't know if you know, Clint Eastwood was the mayor of Carmel by the Sea in 1986. Yeah. No. Yes, he owns just about half the buildings in town, Dave does. And he loves this town, our town. It gives him a lot to keep it looking good, so properly well-maintained. But to tie him down for a cup of coffee at B's or O.W.'s or even quaint M's affix the Catholic Center on Deacon, well, he'll spin that yarn until it frays and splits and disintegrates. Tell us, Dave. Did Clint really wrestle an authentic razor back once? Dave, please be serious. Did Clint really claim that blank happened after blank and blank went to blank with blank? No way. Dave, stop. For the love of humanity. Lucy dotes on her husband, loves him in that my man, that's my man type old-fashioned way. But as Mayor Lucy, she sometimes wishes he promote the city activities as much as he does Clint Eastwood. <laughs> I'm so excited. I think it's just a very sincere, serious story. Is it is are Lucy and Dave based on Trish and Dave? No. But I just want to say Dave's name as many times as I could in the story. Yeah, Dave, I'm sorry. Your name's Dave. You're not the only Dave in the world, okay? I definitely have plausible deniability that I based on you guys. I didn't. I didn't. There you go. Well, I'm just saying. I am beloved of the Schmitz and Moscow. That's why I wrote the story. Guys, we can kind of probably be done. We're almost done with this book. But no, let's go a little bit longer. We're still, I mean, but always, like, this is our fifth class in our own Aquinas. If you revisit it, we have, we're going to have six and a half hours of Aquinas material. It's actually like a mini series in itself. We've covered so, so much in this little book itself, right? Well, let's do some more stuff. We still have some time. Um, war and killing. Is it always sinful to wage war? 
Aquinas answers no, right? We famously know, please note this, Augustine and Aquinas are the two guides that develop our just war theory. And if you want modern thought, I read the National Catholic Reporter. Anyone read that uh, thing? National Catholic Reporter, I read it for the leftist commentary. It's very much the left. I think once it was, it was ordered to stop using the name Catholic in his name, and it still does. Um, so you have a National Catholic Reporter um, on the left, National Catholic Register, the W10, more centered to the right, probably, right? EDM and then 10. Wanderer on the more right. Wanderer, oh, Michael Matt. Do you watch Michael Matt, Remedy TV at all? Every once in a while. But yeah, I, so exactly. My, quite stomach the that far. So, right. Yeah, exactly. But right, Michael Matt, Wanderer, super pro Latin mass, very much to the right. Exactly. Um, church militant, very to the right. Um, <laughs> Sure, yeah. And again, I'm, I'm saying I, it's, it's too far to the right. Sure. But as you can see, I'm saying this with no pejoratives, not like, you know, oh, whatever. I'm saying America Magazine, very to the left, very liberal. America, I, I, I don't read them, but I get their daily emails oh, okay. at night. So I read what they're, yeah. a little bit of what they're talking about to get the, the uh, you and, know. And the, that's exactly, yeah, and, that, and that's exactly me. I try to get the full exposure of the spectrum. And National Catholic Reporter, I say, is more to the left than America Magazine, even. And they recently had an article where this was hilarious. And I'm sorry for saying that, but it really was. It was kind of like, come on, guys, where some cardinal was saying, we need to dispense with the just war theory, right? He's like, we should never, there's no just wars anymore. And I think, oh, time out. If you're talking about profiting peace, from the words of our blessed Lord and Savior himself, blessed are the peacemakers, right? The Beatitudes, I'm, we should always be about peace. But the idea there's no just war is absolutely absurd. Oh, okay, so these guys invade the city and do horrible stuff. Let's let them, you know, like, there's, there's a reason why Aquinas and Augustine developed a just war theory. And I'm going to read you these stipulations. But the most crazy thing about this article is Cardinal was talking about. He's like, oh, but the Ukraine is an exception. It's like, come on, guys. You're so in the tank. Like, I personally have nine Ukrainian flags on my house. Maybe maybe I'm 100% in the tank with that. That's still so absurd. Or maybe I'm, I'm not actually, we're going to debate this next class. Maybe I'm like, no, Ukraine is actually not great. I have no comment either way. Even if you are an ardent Ukraine supporter, it is absolutely disgraceful and actually be like, there's no just wars. Oh, except for this one. I mean, CNN mm -hmm. said, you know, I mean, Janet Yellen was in Kiev, Kiev, excuse me. She gave billions of dollars to Zelensky. Oh, that's just, you know, it's like, come on, stop. At that point, you're just admitting, like, I'm just a puppet for whatever the kind of, and I shouldn't say that. You know, I don't want to like, I don't want it to be associated with cardinal and puppet. <laughs> like, I should not judge anyone, but it's like, come on. You're making an argument. There's no just wars ever, except for this one. And you should go all in and give them, no. it's like, that's not, be consistent in your position. If there's no just wars, then say the war needs to end right now. Even if Ukraine has to cede more territory, there's just no just wars. But if you're saying there's just wars because Putin's a bad guy, maybe he is, and he invaded, then there are just wars. Your argument falls apart. You can't have it both ways. There, there's no just wars except for Ukraine. That's when you should give them billions and billions and billions of dollars. I answer that three things are required for war to be just. Indeed, the first requirement is the ruler at whose command the wars be waged has a lawful authority to do so. Number one, lawful authority. Number two, a just cause to wage war, like Putin attacking Ukraine, to take that example. And three, they must be to avenge wrongs and have a, a, good, a good ending, a good telos. One, proper authority, two just cause, three, a good telos. A good telos, I use the example, we're kind of going over material we covered before, which is nice. We're wrapping this book up nicely. We covered a lot of this earlier in the, I started those pink notes, class three, a week and a half ago. Authority, just cause, and a good ending. A good ending is not, I want to punish Dave Schmidt because I hate his tribe. I have a rival tribe. I'm a clan. I want to assault his Cartago de Linda S, salt his tribe to the ground. No, it must be that, you know, I'm the king of my tribe. Dave unlawfully attacked my tribe. And all I'm doing is trying to destroy his army, but I'm not going to attack civilians and just restore the balance of power. And afterwards, Dave has to pay up a, a war indemnity to me, but it's going to be lawful and just. Well, that's just. It can't be the indemnity is he just does whatever I say and his, his whole tribe is enslaved to mine. Like it has to be, it has to be good. Justice, those are exactly the arguments Putin would make. What do you mean? We, you know, we may debate is he a, a just authority or a, whatever the term would be. Yeah. Know, proper authority. But certainly he's saying, I'm trying to, you know, reclaim that is to correct an injustice that happened a long time. Oh, totally. You know, all, you know, so it's a, that's a debate, how it becomes subjective immediately. No, guys, what is the most corrupt country in Europe? Does anyone know? These are these are these are considered um reliable statistics. Anyone know what country is ranked highest in the index of corruption? It's Russia, 
Russia is ranked, but it's fair not. They say it's, uh, it's the most, you know what number two is? What's number two most corrupt country in, in, in well, Ukraine? Ukraine. Ukraine is, is, is as corrupt as Russia, exactly. Zelensky apparently shut down the free press. It's like, it's just, yeah, exactly, certainly. And we're, uh, we're gonna make this case next class and lay out the argument. There's a lot of case to be made on the America, Ukraine, Biden, NATO side. Putin is a former KGB agent, true. Bet on world domination, debatable. Probably seems not, but nonetheless, he seems like he likes to invade stuff and made Ukraine 2014, Ukraine in Georgia 2008. Uh, he has a sketchy human rights record. Well, okay, fine. But then on their side, didn't we promise George E.W. Bush 91 not to expand NATO? And we did. And are we constantly provoking them? And isn't the last eight years like us shelling Eastern Ukraine, you know, with bombs because they seceded? Like it's just way more complicated than the media would make it out to be. Both the CNN left and Fox News right media all kind of seem to maybe oversimplify. And you're right. Maybe you definitely can make that argument. I have no comment. It's just you're 100% right with that. Last point, we finished the book, basically. I mean, I, I might, there's a last section here, Practical Wisdom and Statecraft, I might start with next class. What I want to do next class is dedicated to disputed questions where we've, we've, been, we've been neck deep in Aquinas, knee deep, fill in your favorite, whatever, saying. We know what Aquinas does, and we're going to want to state stuff, ask a question, blank, and then do our objections, postulations. We'll, we'll start with the war in Ukraine, or we'll start with football. We'll definitely do those two. We'll give you three or four more. The next class, remind me, I definitely want to review material. We're quitting for spring break. We'll be off for a week. I want to go back to those first three classes. And we've done a lot of textual analysis. That's what we do when we come back. Let's review the logic again. And that way we'll have started the class with logic, plumber's logic sheets. We'll finish that in April again in the middle of three times I've gone to the fundamental philosophical logical points. Last point is obedience the greatest virtue. I answer that as sin consists of human beings adhering to transitory goods and contemning God. So contrawise, the merit of virtue's acts consists of human beings adhering to God and contemning created goods. Okay, so sin sin says, uh, I am going to even go against God, my, putting myself first. I choose myself over God. Easiest, great definition of sin. Sin is I choose myself over God. The devil himself sadly said that, right? I will not serve. All sin is that I prefer myself to God, whereas holiness, obedience, is I prefer God over everything, even to my own detriment. Ends are more powerful than means. Therefore, if one should contemn created goods in order to adhere to God, one's virtue is more praiseworthy because one adheres to God, because one adheres to God than because one contemns earthly goods. So the virtues whereby one adheres to God as such, namely theological virtues, are more powerful than the moral ones whereby one contemns earthly things in order to adhere to God. Uh, and so all other virtuous deeds are meritorious with God because they are done in order to obey God's will. For example, if one were even to undergo martyrdom, or give away all one's possessions to the poor, such deeds can only be meritorious there in order to fulfill God's will, which rightly belongs to obedience. Just so, neither could such deeds be meritorious if one were to do them without charity, which cannot exist apart from obedience. Uh, for 1 John 2, 4, 5 says, those who say they know God do not keep his commandments are liars, and love of God is truly perfect in those who keep his words. And this is so because friendship causes friends to know and will the same thing. So he's saying charity and obedience beautifully united. There's so many things. Our blessed Lord is, is he man or is he God? Yes, he is true man, true God. So too, obedience is the highest virtue, but it's filled with charity. If I'm not charitable, St. Paul, so I don't love like a banging, resounding gong or whatever he says, right? Mm -hmm. Father Ben, would you be so kind as to close us out? Thank you all. See you all on Wednesday. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brother, Father, we continue to thank you for your preciousness in our Lord. Continue to be with us. Give us the grace to continue to grow into the image and likeness of your Son and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. Yes. The mighty God bless you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you all Wednesday. Did you never have a nose ring then? A nose ring? I will never have a nose ring. I figured that. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I say the same thing too. And I'm not saying this to be like uh, whatever it's called, agreeable, uh, politically correct. Like, I don't care if people have nose rings or piercing or whatever. It doesn't bother me at all. I just, yeah, I have no piercing, no tattoos. I don't think that I ever would get one. I would get a tattoo probably before I got an, a ring or an earring or something. Just, mm -hmm. Yeah. If I, if I, someone said, you have to get a tattoo, I, even though a, tat, a, a ring can be temporary, I would probably get a tattoo before I would get a, I just don't like it. I don't know. I just don't like it. But, you know, some people will look great on it. I don't